I want to take a moment to talk to you about Roll TV, our online video library platform. Whether you've been training for a week, a month, a year, or five years, you already know that you need all the tools that you can possibly get and get your hands on to continue improving your skills as you go through the Jiu Jitsu journey. And that's what Roll TV has been designed for. We started this project about a year and a half ago, and from the very beginning, we focus on continuous updates and continuous uploads of techniques that are useful to you. Anything from self-defense to sport jiu-jitsu, anything from individual drills and techniques to the full concepts and lessons from big players like Sophia McDormand, Christian Woodman C., and Andres Bronowskis. In addition to all this, we feature workshops, seminars, and events that took place at Roll Academy. So you have access to all of this at your fingertips. And recently, due to a large amount of requests, we have opened the opportunity for lifetime memberships. No more cancellation fees, no more reoccurring um, payments, no more subscriptions. One simple payment and you have full unlimited access to drills, techniques, full concept lessons, and events from big names in Jiu-Jitsu. How can you beat that? Go to rollacademy.tv, create a free account, take a look what the platform has to offer, and subscribe to continue improving your jiu-jitsu. And now, let's get back to Roll Radio. Robert Drysdale has made history in the world of BJJ, winning multiple titles including the ADCC World Championship and the IBJJF Championship. But now, he is dedicating himself to exploring and telling the history of BJJ itself. On this episode of Roll Radio, Robert describes his journey and the journey of telling the true history of jiu-jitsu in Brazil, the latter of which took him back to Brazil to interview some of the legends of BJJ, grandmasters who were there when jiu-jitsu first began to flourish and who share with Robert their first-hand knowledge of those days and what led to the art we know of today. This journey and those interviews became the forthcoming documentary, Closed Guard, The Origins of Jiu-Jitsu in Brazil, and the companion book, Opening Closed Guard, The Origins of Jiu-Jitsu in Brazil, The Story Behind the Film. Here is Roll Radio with one of the most accomplished grapplers of his generation and a true historian of BJJ, Robert Drysdale. Welcome to Roll Radio. And we are live. Gary, how are you? I'm fantastic. I'm looking forward today. I think we're going to learn a lot. Um, and uh, I think we have uh, a super high profile guest with us. So it's going to be exciting for the listeners as well. I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation. We have uh, Professor Robert Drysdale in the house. And, um, you know, he's going to share bits of history, jujitsu history. And I think some of that might actually surprise some of you guys um, because what you might know or what we know up to this point, well, we might be learning some new things, some things that maybe we didn't know and some of the things that we did know and they might not necessarily be what we thought they were. But we'll get into all of this. Professor, thank you for being here. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, no, I'm excited to prospect to be able to you know, share some of my experience and, and, and some of the you know, some, some of you things that I'm learning as well, you know, like I far from the know it all when it comes to the uh, jujitsu history, I feel like I'm, I'm learning throughout the process as well, but it's been a really, really fun journey. That's for sure. So let's start from kind of from the beginning. How, how, how did you get into jujitsu and, and you started in, in your teens, but how, how did that unfolded? Why did you start jujitsu? What got you on the mat? And, and, and I think that's going to kind of pre-frame this project that you're currently working on, which is your book and your documentary. Um, I guess my, my beginnings in jiu-jitsu were, um, you know, I think I was like any other teenager on, on, on the planet. We're all looking for something, you know, like something happens between that age of, you know, 14 and 18, where you're trying to define yourself. You're looking for an identity. You're looking for a place to belong. You're looking to prove yourself in some way. Some of us are fortunate, you know, we don't, we don't have to work when we're 16. You know, some people of us do. I didn't have to. Um, I mean, I've had part-time jobs, but they don't really count. Um, 
and I, I was, it was, it was great because like it gave me a sense of meaning, I think very early on in life. And I think that's like the, probably one of the hardest things that people have is like finding the, which mountain to climb. And you got to get something you're passionate about early in life. And jujitsu was it for, I, as soon as I, I started hearing about Hoist Gracie, when I started hearing about the reputation that jujitsu practitioners were starting to develop in Brazil, which was not a pretty one. It's very important to remember. They, they were known as pit boys, mm -hmm. meaning like hooligans, basically. They were hooligans. Mm -hmm. They would go to nightclubs and beat everyone up, and they would go. No one would mess with them. And as a teenager, I'm not very proud of this, but I, I couldn't be forgiven because I was a teenager. <laughs> that was exactly what attracted me. <laughs> yeah. Were you still here in the States at that time, or were you still no, in Brazil? Yeah. I was, I was in Brazil, sorry. Yeah, I was in, I, I moved to Brazil when I was six. Right. So, you know, from six to 17, I was in Brazil. Then I went back for another eight years, two years in the U.S., eight more years in Brazil. But that was, it was very appealing to a teenager that you could be the alpha male in any room. Like people would be scared of you. Women were going to like you. Like people were going to, I mean, respect, right? Prestige. Like these things are, are important for for a young male, and at some point you mature out of that, and, and you you know you, you realize there are far more important things, and there's a lot more to jujitsu than just imposing you know your your alpha maleness or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it was it was it, that was what, what initially attracted me for sure. Yeah, and, and it, it's my understanding that jujitsu in general, even to this day in Brazil, is not viewed as something positive. It's kind of kind of the underground kind of the bad boys bad boys group is that is that the perception that you've had at that time look there's been a uh, there's been an effort to clean that image over the past 20 years yeah. but again it's a history that's very old and it goes back to the, the separation from judo you know that's the only way jiu-jitsu practitioners in brazil had to market themselves they didn't have the olympics they didn't have the government they didn't have the private sector they didn't have the population on their side it was complicated to understand Niwaza or ground grappling, very complicated. The average person understands Bruce Lee and Van Damme, but doesn't understand jiu-jitsu. So how do we promote this? The only way they found was by being bullies, basically. So, you know, obviously in Brazil, the, the, the reputation was earned through a very, very negative marketing, but it, it worked. In a very strange way, it worked. Uh, but I think the last 20 years, like I said, there's been an effort to clean that up, and a lot has changed. Like, I wouldn't say that image remains today in Brazil. I think it's a lot, I mean, maybe in some corners, but it's, there's not a lot of that pit boy mentality left in the Brazilian psyche. Interesting that one of the biggest, probably the most important thing for that to change was the acceptance of not only MMA, among the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but also MMA in Brazil, in the United States. It was when MMA or slash Valetudo blew up in the in the in the united states and europe and japan and and that's when brazilians were like oh so brazilians are cool after all okay we accept this it was and i and i talk about this in the book like it is mm -hmm. my brazilian friends forgive me i love brazil but it, i feel it's true there's a sense of like almost like a inferiority complex like it is only good if someone else approves it if we can't approve it ourselves and that was the case with valetudo and bjj yeah, so I mean, are you seeing these things when you were early on in your teens? Because you started with about seventeen, is that is that correct? Sixteen, 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 seventeen. Yeah. Are you seeing these things, or or at this point you just want a purpose and you're joining martial art of jujitsu? Why jujitsu? I guess my question. I I think that other martial arts did not have that appeal. For example, taekwondo uh, did not have that. I did have keto when I was younger. But I think they had the other martial arts worked really hard to develop a reputation for being about honor and respect and the exact same things I try to teach today. But in, in jujitsu was never about that. Jujitsu was about efficiency. Jujitsu was about, I can beat you up. I don't give a shit about your philosophy. It was very practical. It was very materialistic. It was very, you know, prove it in the moment. There's no BS. And that was very appealing. But to answer your other question about me reaching these conclusions, uh, I think that they matured over time, a lot of them. Like the one about Brazilian society not accepting it, that was well before my research in history. Like that was just jumped at me, like how quickly Brazilians warmed to, to MMA once Dana White, you know, made the UFC a household name in the West. It was only after Dana White. Before that, like Brazilians frowned upon Valetudo. They thought it was disgusting. Like if you told your, if your girlfriend told her dad, that your, her boyfriend did jiu-jitsu and volley tudo, 
you, there'll be a family meeting trying to convince the girl to break up with you kind of thing. Like, it's like, no, no, that's not the right man for you. It's, um, it, it's, it was frowned upon because you were seen as almost quasi criminal. You were a quasi criminal uh, in some, in some households. And who changed that was, was Dana White. Dana White is the one who changed that ultimate fighter. It was that. And then Brazilians accepted it right away. Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, Minotauro, they become heroes in Brazil overnight. I guarantee you they were overwhelmed. They were not expecting it because it was overnight. It was very, very strange for me how quickly Brazilians changed their mind on, on Valley Tudo. So let me ask you this. So, so you talk about Dana White making that change and, and making that impact here in the U.S., but let me ask you this. Was it Dana White or was it Gracie family by introducing UFC 1? Because Dana White doesn't exist at that point. This is not as visible, right? This is being... At this point, this is being ran by Gracie family in the very beginning of UFC. So the, what the Gracie, I mean, the Gracie, I mean, Horry created the UFC. There's right. no way. Out of that. But that period between 93 and the ultimate fighter, early 2000s, those 10 mm-hmm. years, it was still seen in Brazil as something barbaric. It was seen as like, you know, um, like, like gladiators in the arena. That's, they didn't look at it as a sport. Yeah. Still but was here, it, too. Yeah, it still is. Right. Like, in, it, well, it still back is. then, New York, you couldn't get a card. You couldn't get a card in Colorado, right? I, I think mean, there were a handful know. of states that you could. Yeah. 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 Between 93 and Ultimate Fighter, it was frowned upon worldwide. There was a coordinated effort. Now, it's funny because like, I was just talking to uh, um, Joe Silva, who was, I don't think he fully gets the credit for what he did in the U.S. I agree. I think he was, he was that silent mind. Mm-hmm. Just like IBJJF, you know, Marcelo CDM is, is the silent mind behind the growth of IBJJF. Carlos Gracie Jr. gets all the credit, even though he's super important. Mm-hmm. And UFC, it's kind of like Dana White got all the credit. Joe Silva was the one who was adamant, we need to make this a sport. Where people are like, no, we want the gladiator in the arena, bloody. Mm-hmm. You know, that's our market. And Joe's like, we need to make this a sport. And he was that voice. So he played a large role there. And I think that that was the right strategy, but it took a while. It took a minute. And it was only when the American mainstream accepted it, that it changed in Brazil. And that's when everyone was like, oh, those, those graces are, are Brazilians, right? Oh, wow. We're so proud of them now, right? They were so proud of Vanderlei Silva all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, but it was, um, you know, it really is a cultural issue. It's, it's, it's uh, Brazil is, they, they see themselves as younger brothers to the United States. They may not like that interpretation but that's how i read it and it's an identity issue i think it's an identity issue and um you know well it, it is what it is but it was um it was a very quick transition for sure it definitely unfolded fairly quickly it just it just handful of years and it just blew it up right um i, I think what's interesting about you particularly that you had this view from a brazilian perspective living there for a number, your number of years which you, a big part of your life and then obviously having the exposure of being here in the U.S. and and you are here now and running business in one successful academy and it gives you the perspective of the two two worlds. You you've seen both of them on each side of the, um, uh, on each side, right? Is is that part of what drove you to writing this book and going through this project of the documentary and kind of trying to dig into the history of jujitsu, trying to answer the questions that you didn't have answers to? Uh, you know what, man? Like, it's difficult to answer some of these questions. Like, you, you can talk about motivation. Like, why do you train jiu-jitsu, right? And then people go to that superficial answer that goes, oh, I want to learn how to defend myself. Or I want self esteem, Or I want to be fit, you know? Like, I don't think that's the real reason why we go to the gym. We all have different interior motivations that are often hidden from us. We're completely unaware of what these motivations are. And it's very difficult to get to them. I don't think it's as simple as people uh, make it sound. I, in the case of like history, I, I think I've always been confronted with difference because my father is American, and my mother's Brazilian. So cultural differences to me, like, and I've been going back and forth. So I've, I've, I've developed a habit out of comparing, like comparing to me is like something I do all the time. Like if I, I'm always contrasting things. So for me to contrast Brazilian and American culture in, in jujitsu terms, in jujitsu language was just very, very natural. So I think I was able to maybe see things in a way that, you know, Americans, people, are, they're ethnocentric. There's just no way around it. Americans are going to see, of course, our values are better. Brazilians feel the exact same way. Sure, Polish feel the exact same way. Every culture in the world has that. But I guess maybe somewhat my background made, forced me to view things differently and really appreciate the good things about the U.S. as well as the good things about Brazil. 
and you know, and be able to spot the bad, be able to spot the things I didn't like about American culture, spot the things I didn't like about Brazilian culture. And I, I mentioned some of these things in the book, you know, and, and, and um, I think that, you know, that, that's, I, I, I call it critical love, you know, tough love. I think that's, that's how you manifest your patriotism. It's not a popular position. <laughs> well, it's a realistic position. I don't think people follow that that very much there there's always the pie in the sky or the they want to see the glossy version of where they are from or what they do uh it's and it's good to see the a more realistic picture of it so what gets you to write this what gets you to write the book what where's where's the project start it's funny man like um there was a uh, can't remember the name of the book it was like an italian philosopher the life of me i can't remember his name but it was something about like creativity as a product of of not boredom but of idleness and i'm like no you can't be idle you need to work you know like work ethic all the time and then quarantine put me put us all in a position where you're gonna be bored <laughs> you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna be you're not gonna be you know sitting on your butt for the next two months and being productive because <clears throat> there's nothing to do <clears throat> don't want to leave the house everyone's locked in gym's closed like what do you do the first week was, I don't know if you use the word depression. I think that would like, you know, insult people who actually suffer from depression. But it was very, it was very dark. It was very, you know, like gray and. A lot of unknown. Yeah. It just unknowns. Like, was this the end of the world? Like the bubonic plague of our age? Are a third of my friends going to die? Like, I don't know. You know, we don't, I, I may be being dramatic, but at the time, like, I think that's what's going through people's heads. No one knows anything. But at some point. I realized that this was a perfect opportunity for me to, you know, do the things that I've been talking about doing. And, um, and like not, it, it, was, it was an opportunity. Like, why am I complaining? This is what I've been waiting for for the past 20 years of my life. I've been complaining I don't have time. And now I have the time to learn how to play the guitar. I have time to read all those books I've been wanting to read. I, you know, at some point, one of the historians, you know, we, we exchanged messages with, he's helped us a lot in the project, Roberto Pedrera. He suggested that I write an article about my memories of making the documentary because he thought it was a cool story. And I'm like, I think it is a cool story. Maybe some people will be interested. So I'm gonna write like a 2,000, 3,000 word article maybe. Maybe people will read it, maybe they won't, don't know. And I sat down and I started going. Every time I'd write, I'd remember something else. Oh, I gotta talk about this too. And then I'd write a little bit. Oh, I got the next thing you know, when I started piecing the thing, it was all over the place. It wasn't, a, there was no, there was no, the, the, the process of writing is very, it's chaotic, it's hard. There's no, there's no conduit, you know, there's no common thread until at the end when you wrap it up. Yeah. But at some, I went from 2,000 words to like 50,000 words very, very quickly. It was like, this is not an article, this is a book. I can keep going and I kept going. And then I had the idea of adding the interviews because, and that was the last, that was funny, it's funny, that's, it was the last thing on my mind was to add the interviews because I, wait a second, these are going to be on a hard drive forever. This is interesting stuff. And it's not going to make it into the documentary. I got to use it somehow. So it added a lot more. I thought it was going to be an 80 page book. It turned out to be a 400 page book. And, um, and it was, it was, it was probably one of the most exciting things I've ever experienced in my life. And I say this sincerely, it sounds like BS, but like sitting down and writing, this was so much fun. So what was it more exciting writing the book or actually talking to these people? They were both exciting in different ways. I think that, you know, the, the interviews had some excitement about it that was like, holy cow, we're actually making history. I didn't, throughout the process, that's when it started dawning on me that these men were all dying and that I might have been the last person to interview them. And these guys are in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of nowhere. And they haven't given interviews. Well, some, of, some of them are already gone. By the time you started it, right. Five right. I mean, this is, I think this is what, at least it was, my eye open and mind blowing for me is like as you're working on this project these guys are disappearing and how many of them have disappeared that we that you do talk about yeah. why are you even starting this right like it, i feel like it, you know if you didn't write this and if you didn't take this project on some of these things would never be told i mean we don't we can't tell future but i think you in a way you are contrib you're contributing to this the story, the, the, the history, the, 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 what jiu-jitsu really is. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But this, this is the mind-blowing part for me. Yeah, it was, and it was not, you know, these thoughts, everything we're talking about here, it, it, was, it was an evolution. I didn't have, initially, 
I just wanted to tell the story. And the, the one that caught my mind was like, wait a second, there's no Gracie Academy in 1925. Mm-hmm. Wait a second, the guy who opened the Academy, the Gracie Academy is not a Gracie. Carlos had other teachers. And that's what kind of like, wait a second, who the hell is George Gracie? Wait, mm-hmm. this guy is one of the founding fathers of MMA and he's forgotten by his own family. Wait a second. That's what kind of got, those are the initial, you know, excitements. And then at some point interviewing these, these old masters, I realized how important, you know, it, what, what we were doing really was in, in terms of, you know, preserving our history. And, um, you know, it, it, because like you said, we've lost five of them. We've lost five of these grandmasters since we filmed the, the finished film it two years ago. So yeah, I feel it's, it's def- that was definitely exciting. But the, I think the writing process is more of a, it was me discovering that I enjoy writing a lot more than I, I thought I would. Like it was not boring. It was very creative. It was, I enjoy the process of sitting down. The thing is very time consuming. You need to be alone. You can't be interrupted. That's the main thing. I get interrupted nonstop. Phone, work, you know, kids, whatever. Quarantine forced me to be alone. So it was, that was what, what allowed the book to be, to be possible. So I need another quarantine if I want to write again. <laughs> <laughs> you, do talk, you do talk about something interesting. Some of these big questions like Gracie Academy didn't exist, right? Like there, there was no such thing. And, and literally that made me look things up. That made me, as I was reading and as I was trying to kind of unfold these different events that you talk about in the book, I was like, no, no way. I need to look this up because these are fundamental questions that or fundamental uh, historical items that we've been passed on many, many times. And it's just, it's kind of part of our culture. So how in the world are you going through this process of unfolding or peeling the onion, essentially, and trying to figure stuff out? Because you go by far deeper than Gracie Academy. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, once you, you, you're going to answer a question, it's, you know, we're, we're used to the cookie cutter answer, like the Wikipedia answer. And we all do that. Like, I, I think it's, I point the finger a lot. And I do this throughout the book, people who just believe things because they think they should or because someone else said it. But I think it's impossible not to fall victim of that at some point, because especially if it's a, tru- it's a truth that we like to hear, if it's a fact that is likable, right? Whether it's political, religious, jujitsu, Gracie, pro-Gracie, anti If we people absorb that a lot faster and they do something they don't like, we become skeptic of things that we don't like. Mm-hmm. That things we like, we accept very quickly. And you have to break through that. Like you have to be equally skeptical. And the fact that you like that fact or not shouldn't interfere in that. And I think that's what good history is. You know, if you can really wash yourself clean of all ideological biases and, and, and remain true to the course, which is discovering what happened. And not all this history is pro-Brazilian or is anti-Brazilian. It shouldn't matter. It, you know, if you're being accurate, it doesn't matter. And I think that was uh, really early on, that was a motivation. Like I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, I, I knew I was going to come across as, there's no way you're not going to come across as anti gracie But I'll, I'll say, and I, I say this sincerely, I think that I walked out of this more with more admiration for the Gracie family than, than, um, than I did when I started. And it was because they, they, they were far more important to the history of jiu-jitsu than they gave themselves credit for. It's just that for completely different reasons. The reasons why they gave themselves credit for simply aren't, like, I mean, like, they didn't invent anything. Like, Helio did not invent anything. There was no martial arts rev, technical revolution going on. I, I argue this in the book. The technical revolution mm-hmm. is a problem. IBJJF in the 90s. Up to that point, they were idiosyncratic judokas. They were judokas that specialized on the ground because of an infrastructure problem. There was an infrastructure problem in Brazil. The rooms are small. You don't have big mats like Juro and wrestling. So you start on your knees, and that's where they specialized because that way they could force a draw with the Japanese, and that was their marketing tool. I drew or I didn't lose, I didn't get tapped, so I really won, and they were brilliant in marketing. But what is so remarkable about this whole story to me, and this is, this is a recent you know, conclusion, it's not an old one, is that the whole thing is dead in Brazil for 40 years. No one is paying attention. No one's practicing. No one cares. What we call Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is dead. It has like maybe a couple hundred practitioners in Rio de Janeiro, you know, small pockets throughout the country, right, left by men like George Gracie and, and some other pioneers of the art. But for the most part, like, I've never heard of jiu-jitsu in Brazil. I spoke to Pedro Pano. I just saw, I think you guys knew mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he grew up in Rio de Janeiro. And he had never heard of jiu-jitsu when he was a kid. And he grew up in Rio. Just to give an idea of how dead this thing was. And then Hoist Gracie just set it on fire in 93. 
But between the 40s and 93, you know, there's that big moment with Kimura in 51, really. Mm -hmm. that, that gap, let's say 51 to 93, the whole thing is dead. And they stuck to it. They stuck to their version of things. And that is remarkable. Like, that is the, by far their biggest contribution. You, you talk about something interesting, too, is this evolution of as. As, as this art is unfolding, right? So you take it way back to Japan, you're talking about traditional judo, then it arrives to Brazil. In whichever format we, talk, we can talk about Maeda and his contribution, which is a very interesting topic on its own. But, you know, it gets to Brazil, and then you talk about they, they are not even practicing jiu-jitsu. What we know jiu-jitsu is, is actually, you know, a, a, a variation of judo, right? And then somehow the, the introduction of vale tudo is getting created by some of the guys like some of some of the masters like Carlson Gracie, right? Who essentially put, well, I know you tell me put ballet to it on the map and this all kind of unfolds over decades. Right. Yeah. And now to what we know today as jujitsu and the mixed martial arts in the format of UFC or other organizations. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it was, it was, it was, it's a rich history, man. It's, it's a long process and it's, um, I think it's still maturing in my mind in a lot of ways. And I think that, I think it's going to be a while for the entire community to digest this whole story because you have to reframe things. I make the, I point out in the book, like you mentioned that Maid is not central to any, in my opinion. He's not central to anything. I think he's an interesting guy. He's very interesting. Like he's the kind of guy who deserves a documentary just about him. But as far as him being the cornerstone of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I, I just don't see how. I don't see how. What did he? I mean, if, realistically, what did he do? He opened a gym in the Amazon where he barely taught. He passes the ball on like he taught maybe maybe a couple years. It's hard to say, but not, not a very long period of time. Maybe longer. Maybe like it's hard to say because it, it, it's clear that he passes the ball on to his his, his uh, other Brazilian students, and then he becomes his role in Brazil is really an ambassador for Japanese immigrants. Like that's his biggest role by far. It's not, I mean, he barely, he's retired when he goes to Brazil. But he was used by many, many Brazilians as a central figure because he was famous. So that was his contribution was unwillingly lending his fame. Yeah, it seems to me like the more I learned, the more it seems like he was a showman and a politician, uh, more so than any kind of professor or instructor. Yeah, like I don't think he was interested in teaching. Like imagine, you know, he, I mean, this guy was an adventurer. He had been traveling the world for what three, two, three decades now, and he settles in in well, well less than that, really. Sorry, but um, he was uh, um, he was an interesting guy. But I think he was tired, and at some point of his life, he wanted to make money. I don't think he wanted to fight anymore. He gets to 40, 40 something. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to make money, and he just starts looking for more profitable endeavors, and uh, that's understandable. It's not you know I think most most of us would will do that would do that in in, in his shoes, and. But like they, a lot of Brazilians needed his credibility it, to establish themselves um, in a time where they had no credibility, you know, because no one was going to learn jiu-jitsu from a Brazilian. Think about how hard it was for American instructors to teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu 15 years ago. Uh -huh. You're a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor, you're American, or you're Polish. How, how uh -huh. on earth are you going to teach? No, you have to be Brazilian, of course. It was the same thing for the Japanese. If you can only teach this stuff, if you're Japanese. So Brazilians had to really get creative when it came to marketing themselves, which to me is a very, very, you know, interesting piece of, of, of history right there. So what, do you think that's why the judo jujitsu split took place right, right around that time where jujitsu started being created in a sense, separate art? Yeah. Separate form? Well, it is what happens. Um, when Maeda, like not Maeda, but many Japanese, when they leave Japan, there was no such thing that judo was a very unused term. Okay. It was Kano Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu was a broad term for martial art. It was right. not around. People think, oh, it's ground fighting. No. It was a broad term that included sword fighting. It was a very generic term. When these Japanese start immigrating to the West, they're using the term Jiu-Jitsu because no one's using Judo. Judo is the modern term. Later, it changes. So, you know, younger generation of Japanese immigrants, they start using the term Judo more than Jiu-Jitsu. But in the West, the term Jiu-Jitsu stuck. But they're really teaching, for the most part, they're all Koro Kan Judokas, with very few exceptions. And Maeda was one of them. He used the term Jiu-Jitsu because when he left Japan, that was the common term. He used the term Judo as well, but less so. Normally, he used the term Jiu-Jitsu. When, when Brazilians start separating from, um, and I talk about that separation in the book, they start separating from Judo. They use it as, I think it was like a silent agreement 
between them and the and the Japanese because they agree to do doing different things. So they have to call it different. Things. So the Japanese did not want to be associated with jujitsu because it was an archaic medieval term to them. And Brazilians did not want to be, or the Gracie family primarily, they did not want to be under the Kotokan hierarchy. So if I'm not going to be under the Kotokan hierarchy, I clearly can't call it judo. I need to call it something else. Jiu-jitsu was just the easiest, most available term that no one else cared to use, so they stuck with it. But, you know, what we practice is it's niwaza, it's ground judo. There's nothing pre-meiji about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is just a variation of judo. There's just no way around it. There's no, oh, Maeda taught them secrets that they were hiding from. The, that's a load of nonsense. <laughs> you know? Maeda, Maeda was, was a judoka. He had an experience in sumo. He was a judoka. And he had a brief experience with catch wrestling. Catch wrestling might have influenced him, you know, somewhat in terms of submissions and, you know, who knows what else. But there's, there's no, Maeda had no idea what a, a, a pre-Meiji Jiu-Jitsu school would have looked like. So, for, you know, for, oh, you know, Carlos was learning, you know, the secrets that, you know, that's it's just, there's, there's no, there are no secrets. That's, that's just good marketing. Interesting. Yeah, it makes for a good story, folklore. Uh, we had Caprito on recently and he was talking about, you know, we, we brought some stuff up that people had said and he's like, no, that's just folklore. You know, it's, it's not reality, um, <laughs> uh, which was great to hear because, I, you know, again, it's just people want to believe the stories they've been told. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe there's an, I mean, there's, there's, a, um, there's a need for that. Like, for example, I'll give you another myth. Like, Helio was never a weak individual. He was an elite swimmer for an elite club in Rio de Janeiro, even before he trained jiu-jitsu. Like, there are pictures of Helio. You can Google this. And he, he looks like he's 17, 18, and he's buff. Like we're talking, and, and then people were not as muscular as they are now. Like nutrition wasn't there. Like these things, they didn't understand like working out like we do. And, but he looks very fit, you know, they like, always oh, used to get sick. Everyone gets sick. Like, but, you know, but they framed him as a weak individual because that was a better sales pitch for the American market, which was necessary. Without that, if Hoist Gracie had been a super athletic guy, right? You think that would have been as convincing? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But Hoist Gracie wasn't athletic. I mean, he didn't look athletic. He looked like a guy that you can fold in half. But he went, you know, what he was doing was absolutely incredible. So, you know, when, 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 you, when you look at that, you go, wait a second here. This marketing was necessary. Like maybe, like maybe Carlos would have never gained any credibility had he not attached himself to Maeda. Maybe, you know, maybe all of this was, maybe even the, 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 the hooliganism and the, and the bullying and the street fighting. That was necessary, the valitudo, to carve a space, to, to create uh, 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 some breathing room by, you know, from a, a, a art, a, an art that wasn't even born yet, and it was overshadowed by judo. Judo was overwhelming jiu-jitsu in every sh shape. Uh, uh, There's just no way they could keep up with judo in terms of marketing and credibility. So they had to get creative. And I think that some of, this, this, some of these methods were, you know, they weren't pretty, but they, they, the folklore included, uh, the methodology the challenging, the dojo storm, and it's all very ugly. But I think it might have been necessary for them to breathe at a time where they just couldn't compete with judo, they didn't stand, or any other martial art for that reason. Do you think if they didn't tell, take those actions and, and, you know, fluff it up a little bit with, with, with the marketing, marketing strategies that jiu-jitsu wouldn't be what it is today? I mean, that's very a hypothetical question, but that's kind of what, it, what it's leaning into. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I think that it's, it's impossible to say. It's impossible to say for sure right. what would happen. But I, I, don't see, um, I don't see BJJ existing without UFC, without Valitudo. <clears throat> I don't see the Gracie family surviving without all those years, you know, teaching an art that was not interested in Brazilians at all, had it not been for their ambition. I think that's the key ingredient. Like when people ask me, what's the cornerstone of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? And I say, it's Carlos Gracie's ambition. That's, that's my answer. His ambition is mother and father to jiu-jitsu. Like, he was a very, very ambitious, dedicated man to a vision. I don't think his biggest contribution is technical as a coach or as a fighter. I don't think that's it. But he was a very ambitious man. And that's important because, you know, you don't do things unless you have an ambition to get it done. Oh, absolutely. That passion for it is what, what, drives you, what drives you to achieve the goals that you have. Let's, let's talk about the documentary a little bit. So it, it, I think this is what makes this very, very interesting. It's not necessarily the history of Jiu-Jitsu, which I think brings all of us together and makes us, you know, want to wait and watch this, this film. 
But I think if you read, when you read your book and you kind of start sponging this, this entire process, one, you travel between several countries. I mean, you cover a large amount of world from a travel perspective and you talk to these, these individuals and some of them are in the very, very remote locations. Yeah. How in the world are you accomplishing? How do you contact these guys? How, first of all, how do you make a selection? Let's just start from the beginning. Because you pick some interesting personalities, that's one. But there's a lot of people that I thought you would talk to, they are not on the list. And so how, what makes you talk to this, not somebody else? Um, it, that, that, that was a harder process. Like finding them was, was kind of, was fun and easy and I can't take much responsibility. Look, throughout this process, like I, I would hate this to be the Robert Dreisner project because it's not Robert has, I think I've played a leading role in this, but a lot of people have been very helpful, not only with the documentary, but the book, and, and they deserve a lot of credit. In terms of finding these guys in Brazil, there's a research called Fabio Takao, and he knew them because he had been in contact with a lot of these grandmasters over the years, and he made that bridge. So he made con contacting them, like normally talk to the son or the daughter, and she's the one who arranges the interview, and like, look, we've got a huge production here, it's gonna change the history of Jiu Jitsu, we really wanna talk to your dad. And the daughter would arrange like, hey, dad, will you please talk to these jiu-jitsu aficionados? you got to put a gi on and smile. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what the nature of arranging these interviews. Because these guys, a lot of these guys are in their 90s. They don't care. They're like, oh, I don't, they'll do it. But it's funny because they're very open about speaking what they've thought. As something happens at older age, we just don't give a yeah. shit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, they're very, very sincere. But se uh, selecting um, the, the, the interviewees, was difficult because there's no way you can be arbitrary. And we got a lot of flack for that because like, oh, why didn't you interview Osvaldo Alves? Why didn't you interview Vinicio mm -hmm. Huas, like the last you know, student of Sataki? And one thing, if you look at our documentary, I think we interviewed, I think the total was like 36 people. I think 36 is a pretty large number of people mm -hmm. we interviewed for a 90 minute film. And you could have argued that like, you know, we, you know, this person was more important than that one. There's a logistical problem as well. Obviously, we can't spend, you know, we, I, every single person involved in this production has a full-time job. Like, I'm, I'm a busy guy, too. It's, it's um, you know, it, my, my work schedule is, is pretty hectic. And, and, and it costs me a lot, too. Filming this film, you know, has cost me a lot. And um, it's, um, there's just no way around it. Like, it, I mean, you could film, interview uh, so many people. Cases like people like, for example, there's some people that, you know, they're not historians and they're not that old, like Andre Pedernaris and Mario Yamazaki. Mm -hmm. But they create a bridge between the past and the present. And I think that bridge is important. Plus, they were there. They didn't have to go anywhere. Mario Yamazaki was the one who brought his father over. He's right there. Like, we don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to fly and spend like a week, you know. It's, he was right there. The cameras are there. Just sit down. And, and it was important, I think, to create, you know, bring people like Kira Gracie and Mario Yamazaki and Andre Pedernaris because they give. They, they, they color the past with, uh, I think, a color that is more familiar with the, the people in the present. You know, cause if you just drop a bunch of people there that no one's ever heard of, you can't. I think a lot of people would have a harder time relating to that history. Like, oh, so wait a second. Like, this guy is, you know, and, and, and then like that, the representatives of, of a newer era that is also important to jujitsu history. A lot of it didn't make it, it's not going to make it into the film, but made it into the book some questions that are a little more contemporary. They're not really pertaining to birth of jiu-jitsu per se, but they're still interesting. Like Carlson Gracie, super interesting guy. He doesn't make it into the film, but he's probably the most important Gracie of all time, in my opinion. You know, he's up there. Like, he's, you know, you have to rank him, like, as the most, one of the most important figures. Um, but, like, it was somewhat of an arbitrary process. The most important ones, even the grandmasters were super important, and the historians, those two categories. But it's, it's, the, it's like anything else in life. Some of these grandmasters had a lot more to say than others. Some of them, and I, I'm not going to mention names, but some of these guys that we did an interview that everyone was asking us to interview, they're just straight out liars. And I, you know what, I'm going to skip that because he has a reputation for lying and inventing and pumping himself up. And I don't want that guy. And then we're like, oh, but, you know, he's important, but like, he's going to be lying. Like, I'm going to have to edit him out the whole time. Like, I don't want to do that. Did anybody turn you down? And you don't have to mention the names, but did anybody turn you down and said, I don't want to be part of this project? Oh, yeah. Um, well, people turn us down for different reasons. Very different. Right. I would imagine so. Yeah. Um, you know, Horian wanted, uh, wanted to get paid. Uh, Hala Gracie wanted to get paid. Uh, There's a researcher in, in Brazil called Hildo. He wanted to get paid. And I'm like, I'm not going to pay. You. I'm not going to pay you guys. Here. Like, I'm sorry. And they were asking for it. It was not a small amount. It's in the book. Like, it's, they're not talking about small amounts mm -hmm. here. 
to get rich off the film. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not paying. It would be nice to have you, but I'm not going to pay. And then there were people like George Midi, who was probably the person I was most excited to interview because he, had a, he was a student of the Gracie Academy, had a fallout. And, you know, he was known as being a, 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 an enemy of particularly Helio Gracie and Carlos. He didn't really like him. And I knew he, he, I knew he had a lot to say because he had lived at the academy. And everyone loved him except, like, you know, pretty much Helio and, and Carlos. They, they had a very uh, contentious relationship. And he emerged. He becomes a judoka. He goes to Japan. He trains in Japan. And he's a very humble guy, very interesting guy. And he wouldn't give us an interview. We had Flavio Bering beg him on the phone for, to give us an interview. He wouldn't do it. He would not, and then he died like shortly after. So that that was, I wish if I had a time machine, I would have like set camp in front of his gym and said like, I'm not leaving <laughs> until you give us like a one hour interview. I I just wanted to meet him really. He's a very interesting guy to me. Who was the most impactful for you? I'm sorry, Gary. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who was the most impactful for you? So who, maybe who gave you the biggest surprise as far as meeting them, personality, the conversations that you had? Because again, like, I, I, I am the generation of jiu-jitsu behind you. Like, I was looking up to you in a sense of, you, you know, this is Robert Dries. As a matter of fact, as we were getting ready for this interview, I'm, like, stoked, drooling. We're going to talk to Robert. Boom. And, but but you're, you're taking to the next level. You're not, you're not even talking about the, the generation before you. This is two or three generations before you. Like, th these are the guys who are there. Yeah. It's the first generation of, of practitioners, right? Like, other than, like, right what we call Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, not, right. you know, the split from Judas and older, you know, but like, you know, we're talking 40s, 50s here. And uh, I think there, there are three characters that really jumped at me for completely different reasons, but they really, they, they, their interviews were so rich, right? Uh, the first one I knew it was going to be a good interview was Armando Reedit, which is the guy with the big beard. Like he was very open, such a sweetheart, man. He's just that, he's just like that grandpa that you just want to sit next to him and just listen to him all day. He had so many stories. He was so nice and friendly and a truly amazing human being. Like he, it was, when I left, I was like, man, I know I'm going to miss this guy because he's not, I'm not probably not going to see him again. And he's a truly, truly incredible person. I, I love, he was probably my favorite person out of this, uh, that we interviewed. Why? Why? What made him so? I, I think, you know, it's, look. I think people often try to play a part. I think we all do at some stage in our life. We try to be someone who we're not, right? We're just trying to act a part and, you know, put on an act. And Armando was very sincere, like maybe because of his old age, he would have been like 92, I think, when we spoke to him, 93 maybe. And um, he was just a bit, you know, he liked nature. He walked around naked. We weren't there to see it, but like he got ready <laughs> for walking around naked. He's a very, very charismatic guy in a very good way. Like he, would be dropping Gandhi quotes on you. Maybe I'm in love with that sort of figure. Maybe it's more in my mind than anything. But, but he's the guy that any, any YouTube video you look or find or, or any picture that is out there, he's either in Speedos or shorts and, and, or the gi. Like that's, that's, and the big beard. Like you can't miss that guy. Yeah. And he was just so full of life. And, and you know, you, you, he would see you, he'd hug you. And he was just like very, very, just such a sweetheart. The other one that jumped at, a, uh, uh, at me was, was Hobson Gracie for very different reasons. Also extremely charismatic. Like Henzo's father is one of the most charismatic people I've ever met in my life. Like he's another one. He just, you just want to listen to the man and you just like everyone he talks, he just hypnotizes you. And he had such great stories. And he was very eloquent. That was probably my favorite thing. Armando was like a great vocabulary in Portuguese, outstanding vocabulary. Hobson Gracie was... Um, Highly intelligent. I was surprised at how intelligent he was. Very eloquent. Like he was he's like what, 85? I can't remember his age now, but he's like hitting on the on the waitress at the uh the restaurant <laughs> where he, he's making moves on her. And I'm just listening, like, man, I gotta start writing down those lines. <laughs> Some good pickup right there. You know, he's killing. Like, I'm just listening to this man and like, holy shit, this guy's a black bullet pickup. And it was, it, it was just so, he had so many stories. Very, very charismatic. Very different for Armando in a lot of different ways. But I think, you know, I think Henzo was charismatic. You have to multiply that by 10. Like his father is true, true. In Brazil, we say uh, uh, figura, which means figure, which means like a character. Like he's a true character. Very, um, very outspoken. He, had, he, had said, he, he said one of the things, it was probably one of my favorite things in the whole documentary. It was a light bulb moment because I didn't see it. He brought it to my attention. I was like, what would Maeda be without my father? Because I asked if jiu-jitsu would exist without his father, Carlos Gracie, right? 
And he goes, what would Maeda be without my father? Maeda would be a tale, a myth of the Amazon. He would be the, 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 the tale of the pink dolphin. No Japanese except like some enthusiastic researcher out there would have even heard of him. You know, there, there he was, my father, the jiu-jitsu man, right? Carlos Gracie, the jiu-jitsu man. And it was a light bulb moment because like, holy cow, he's right. Maeda doesn't create Carlos. Carlos creates Maeda. Mm -hmm. Without for Carlos, no one would have ever heard of Maeda. Maeda is depicted in the Kodokan Museum. There's a picture of Maeda there. We, we were there, like, oh, there's Maeda. Maeda would not be depicted in the Kodokan Museum, I'm convinced, had it not been for Carlos Gracie's marketing efforts. Kodokan acknowledges that piece of their history, because of Carlos Gracie. Now, Carlos Gracie is not there, obviously. But Maeda would have been a footnote in history had it not been for Carlos. I have no doubts about that. Interesting. Oh, so no, interesting. Just the last one. Just I, I got one more. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, please. Talking a lot. <laughs> but uh, Yuki Nakai, and he was, man, I don't, I don't understand Japanese. And that's, I'm still, I wish I had learned Japanese just to be able to interview some of these guys because I'm depending on, the, on our translator, Max, the whole time to talk to him. But we, I asked him a question, and this is probably my favorite answer of the whole film, one of them. And he goes, so what was the perception of the Japanese when they saw jiu-jitsu coming back to Japan, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, or their version of judo, whatever you want to call it? Mm -hmm. And what, would, what was it like? Because he's the president of the Japanese Brazilian jiu-jitsu federation, right? So he's, a, he's that bridge. He started with Kosen judo, which is very similar to Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he becomes a representative of Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Japan. And he goes, it was three things. The first thing was surprise and no idea that there was such thing as, you know, Brazilians were experts at Niwaza. They had no idea of what was going on in Brazil. They, like, clueless. The whole world was clueless. It was really a surprise to the martial arts world that, you know, these Brazilians were specializing in Niwaza and they were great fighters. So the first one was surprise. The second one was fear, right? Because, like, man, these guys are good. <laughs> they can fight. <laughs> They're not not your average you're like these guys can put their hands up throw some punches clinch you and choke you out and the third feeling was like a, a sense of lost loss a, a sense of nostalgia over something that was no longer there something that they had given up after the war they had neglected you know Niwaza, and it had to be reversed and ported back to japan for them to appreciate something that they created in reality brazilians didn't create this like, this is a japanese product uh, a product of of Japanese, um, you know, post Meiji culture of that's where Kodokan was born, but they neglected it. And I, I, I call this a mistake in the book. I think judo made a huge mistake by neglecting the ground. And had they not done that, there would have been no space for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to exist. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu only exists because of Kodokan's mistake. And you can kind of make that very clear. And it was so beautifully put. It was just made me very thought. Of course, I had to wait for the translation, which is not, you know, the same as really getting the, 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 the meat and potatoes out of, of the mouth of, of, of someone like Yuki Nakai. But it was very, very rich experience culturally, too. It was quite, the, you know, it's, it's a very Brazilian-oriented environment in Japan, which was at enormous contrast with the Kosen Judo gyms and the Kodokan. Culturally, they're like different planets, which is another piece of this equation that I think people neglect. They think it's just the art that has attracted people. I think it's Brazilian culture. It's the surf culture, the fist bump, the acai, mm -hmm. the bops, the relaxed manners on and off the mats. It's very, very Brazilian. That's not Japanese. And in a way, it is black and white um, comparison to Japan, right? Japan is, is, the Japanese culture is very structured, very, very laid out, very planned um, with, with a you know, somewhat harsh regime when it comes to martial arts and, and judo in particular, right? Where Brazilian jiu-jitsu is by far, far more relaxed is the opposite side of the spectrum it's kind of casual surfing you know acai and so on bumpers and all that it creates these two black and white worlds no you're you're absolutely correct and you know i i it's funny because i had that realization what you just described i had that inside yuki nakai's gym i had so many of these light bulb moments throughout this production it's like boom never thought about that before wait a second mm -hmm. this is super important but it's, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is Brazil's number one cultural export ever. It used to be people say, oh, it's bossa nova and samba and, you know, maybe like the, 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 the G-string bikini or whatever, or like some of the, but I think that Brazilian jiu-jitsu culturally is yeah. what, it's, it's there, I can't think of anything Brazil's ever given to the world in terms of culture that has impacted people more than Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I really can't. 
because when I was in Chechnya, I saw that. I saw it in Australia. I saw it in Japan. I see it in Canada. I see it in the U.S. I was just in Mexico. I see it in Mexico. And they're a little, you know, every culture is different. They, you know, they, you know, every culture has its, its, its own way of being. But a lot of Brazil traveled the world with BJJ as a vehicle. And I don't think Brazilians realize that. I don't think people realize that. That relaxed manner, that fist bump, if you're five minutes late, no one's going to lose their mind. That's very Brazilian. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, if you pay attention, you just even like the way of being like it, it, it kind of like you know, I'm about to get some flack here, but it, it's it's almost like they remain teenagers forever. Like it allows you to become a teen, be a teenager well into your 40s, like even the way we dress. You know, like I, I watch my other friends who don't do jujitsu, who are my age and how they dress. <laughs> I see how I dress daily. And I'm like, I think it allows me to do that. Like, I don't know if other, I mean, I can't speak with authority in terms of other martial arts, but I think that relaxed manner, it's certainly not something that common in judo. I don't think they're that strict in other countries. I think Japan is really excessively uh, strict, but I think a big part of the appeal of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is that relaxed culture. Do you think that, that, that filling that void or filling that, 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 that piece that Japanese didn't provide is what allowed Brazil to really make jiu-jitsu what it is today? That's essentially what I'm hearing, right? It was part of that marketing vehicle. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was a quote Khan's neglect of the ground because the ground is fun. It's not easy to sell. I understand why judo went a different route. They needed to sell judo to the Olympics and to the world, and the, mm -hmm. the rows are more exciting for the average viewer. So I understand that, but ground is fun. Like grappling, rolling around, it's fun. Like I've never seen anyone like, oh, this is super boring. Like everyone likes it. But you're right, it's not as entertaining. It's, I mean, I, it's often people refer yeah. to it as, as glorify hugging on the ground, right? I mean, there, there's so much, I mean, mechanically, and when you're trying to understand Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's so much to it. There are layers and complexities and so on. But yeah, when as you a look viewer, at it as a, as a viewer, as a spectator, it's boring as hell if you don't know what's happening. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And it was, that was one reason it was so difficult to sell Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to Brazilians before Hoist Gracie, right? Like, how else are we going to sell this? This is not fun to watch. Even, I love Jiu-Jitsu. And, like, sometimes I'm like, this is not fun. Like, you know, it's, I don't think it's super exciting to watch it, you know, because it's, it's, it can be a slow sport at times. So like, do you think that that was the reasoning why Gracie family here in the U.S. introduced UFC as a mixed martial arts? versus a jiu-jitsu challenge because they could have done that i mean they've yeah, done jiu-jitsu challenges in the academies and garages and all that but clearly didn't take off from a monetary perspective yeah i don't think anybody yeah. would have been interested no you're right i think that you know i i, I refer to there are two great moments in the in the modern history of martial arts i'm referring to martial arts not as in the the, the, the warfare aspect of martial arts i'm talking about what we refer to martial arts to be the daily practice, right? But mm -hmm. There are two great moments. One is Jigoro Kano's brilliance. Jigoro Kano needs to, I mean, his, we got to give the man credit. Mm -hmm. He convinced the world, ministries of education, Olympics, governments around the world, he convinced them that teaching children how to fight was a great means for educating them. Let that sink in. How mm -hmm. do you convince people of that in the 1900s, early 1900s, that teaching children how to fight is a great way to educate. Like, how do you pull that off? Like, that's a difficult argument to sell today after years and years of years of like marketing being hammered through people's heads, like the martial arts are good for your kids. And this man invents that. It, it's incredible. It's the biggest revolution in the history of martial arts. It's, he gets the ball rolling. Every martial artist, anyone who's selling martial arts, oh, even if you're not judo or jujitsu, you owe some thanks to Jigoro Kano because he created that space. Absolutely. The second, the second uh, revolution is Hoist Gracie. And like, oh, Bruce Lee, I think Bruce Lee was a good actor, might have been a good fighter. We have no idea because no one's ever seen him fight, you know, but I think he was, he made it popular to a lot of people. But I don't think there's any great revolution in the sense what Hoist did. What Hoist did was he changed the world forever. Right? No, no one's ever going to look at fighting, you know, uh, uh, the way they used to after Hoist Gracie, after the UFC. And you got to give credit, not just to Hoist. You got to give his older brother credit. Orion is not the most loved character, but I don't think he got his full credit for his ambition because. Man, the guy was sleeping in the back of cars. Like, he's sleeping in the garage. Like, this guy was hustling to make his, like, Carlos Gracie, like his uncle. Once again, the ambition. The, the cornerstone of jiu-jitsu is ambition. And it's not technical. It's not some great technical revolution. Or it's just, we're going to make it. We're going to do this. This is going to happen. I don't care. Um, 
you know, where we stand in the world, where we are right now, we deserve a higher place. And I, the opening quote of the book, I, I chose a, um, a passage from King Lear, that did the bastard speech, right? Mm-hmm. And man is born a bastard, but he's convinced that he's going to change his destiny because I belong in a higher place. I don't care where I was born. And here come these Brazilians from the Amazon, and they invade Hollywood, and they're hustling, and we're going to make it happen. And there could not have been a better vehicle than, than the UFC. Like, they chose the right vehicle. You're right, a jiu-jitsu tournament wouldn't have made a dent in the martial arts world. They had to pitch karate versus taekwondo versus sumo versus judo versus wrestling. And had they not done that, I, no, there's no way any of this would exist. We would all be doing judo now or something else or not training at all. And they, they, the, the, the role of the individual in, in historiography is, is often neglected. People look at the, the grand movements of, of economics and, 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 you know, and nationalism. But I think in terms of our martial arts history, I think Horian is a very, very neglected individual. Like he, he, I don't think he ever got the, the, the credit he deserves for, for his vision and ambition. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, he fundamentally, without his action, we would not be, we would not be doing, very likely we would not be doing what we're doing today. And UFC would not exist, right? Do you think that as much those two had fundamental impact on mixed martial arts, do you think IBJJF had, that level of impact on jiu-jitsu itself because they have changed the game quite a bit. You know, so um, I don't know if you guys got that part of the book or not, but um, I, 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 you know, I try to identify how does jiu-jitsu split from judo? What? Right. Because if, if it's an evolution, by definition, it doesn't have a moment, right? Evolution is, is the opposite of a moment. It's an evolution. Right. But I try to identify three key moments, right? One of them was you know, Helio's match with Yasuichi on. He fights him twice in 35 and 36. And they're both draws, even though Helio got taken out, like, I think, like, 32 times the first yeah. time, 27 yeah. times the second. He's, he's getting – what's interesting about that, this is a new realization, so wait a second. How do you get taken down 32 times in a fight unless you're standing back up all the time? And that's when it clicked. It was like, wait a second. He was trying to fight him in their world. I think that, that's why that moment is so important because – if you get taken down once in a fight and you see you can't hang with that person, you probably pull guard after that. True or false? True. Oh, sure. It's the tr- strategically. You know, it's stupid. Like, I can't hang with this guy on my feet. Maybe after two takedowns, I'm going to pull guard. He doesn't pull guard. He's trying to stand with the Japanese. Let that sink in. 35, 36, he makes the same mistake. He tries to stand up with Yasuichi Ono. Yasuichi Ono's throwing him all over the place. So what do they start seeing? They start realizing, wait a second, we can't beat these guys here. We've got to fight them somewhere else. That's the beginning of the birth of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They start, change, they start specializing on the neglected aspects of Judo. We have a chance at beating them on the ground. We can't hang on our feet. The second moment is the Guanabara Federation of 67. It's the first Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Uh, rule set very similar to IBJJF's. It's its foundation, right? It's a small uh, um, federation. They don't have that many practitioners, small events, but they do exist. They have a rule set. So that once you have a different rule set, you have a different hierarchy of techniques to be practiced, you have a new martial art, essentially. Over time, it becomes a new martial art. The third event is IBJF. Now, IBJF in 94 it happens right after UFC. It's very symbolic that they happen almost together, right? UFC and IBJJF. And because it's so recent, we don't give them the credit they deserve. Like, you know, people don't realize. I, I argue in the book that Carlos Gracie Jr. is more important to the history of Jiu-Jitsu than his father. People think I'm out of my mind. But I think that 100 years from now, when historians are looking, what if, if jiu-jitsu still exists then, assuming it still does, they look back at this period. They're going to see 94 is probably the most important year in the history of jiu-jitsu because of what we call Brazilian jiu-jitsu because that was what created the platform for it to blow up around the world. That was the, board, the birth of the jiu-jitsu Kodokan. IBJJF is the Kodokan mm-hmm. of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It was born in 94. Again, granted, their rule set is much older. The organization itself was born in 94, and that's a huge uh, uh, a moment for Brazil. People realize how important IBJJF is for the growth of Jiu-Jitsu. They've given it structure, credibility, organized tournaments, and they have many flaws, and we can talk about those too, but hey, who doesn't? You know? But the truth of the matter is, like, Jiu-Jitsu would not be where it is if it were not for IBJJF's efforts. And, well, uh, some would even question, would Jiu-Jitsu even exist as a, as a sport, right? Yeah. I mean, at that point, UFC is being established, but if IBJJF would not form itself, it would just continue, continue evolving. Underground. As, underground, yeah, be underground, right? Yeah. And, but imagine this. And look how many different rule sets 
there are in jiu-jitsu now. Think of it, like now. Again, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The World League, ADCC. We can think of like easily 10 different rule sets, right? What that suggests is like a division and lack of cohesion because that doesn't exist in judo. You don't get that in judo. Judo is judo. Correct. Judo is judo. Yeah. 140 years of consistency, cohesion. Every move is named the same thing anywhere in the world you go. Everyone knows what a sotogari is. Mm-hmm. You don't, don't – we, we didn't have we, – we, I, I argue in the book that IBJF comes almost too late because they gave jiu-jitsu structure but almost a moment too late. Had they, because they look at all the, the, the all these different rule sets is, is, is a reflex of how late they are. But they, they, they do show up. They do show up. They do get organized. And I think from now onwards, they're able to kind of give structure and credibility to the sport. Because the key word here is credibility. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm very critical of a lot of professional organizations, because they're all about the excitement, right? Let's sell tickets at any cost. And like, credibility is more important than selling tickets. You know, because once you lose that, you don't. You know, I, you, there's no longevity to the sport. You cannot. The Olympics has been around for how long? Because it has credibility. Judo, same thing. Like, you know, if you hype it up too much, you might sell tickets. You're not necessarily credible. There's no longevity. This so is my, do, you, you know. do you think it'll get there? Do you think there'll be the cohesion in uh, BJJ as there is in other sports? I think that when, when future historians are studying the history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 100 years from now, they're going to look at this moment we're living, 2015 to 2000 to now, you know, whatever, as a key moment because no one knows for sure what's going to happen. But there's there's a coordinated effort to to split you the two, and it's coordinated and uh, it's very weak. It doesn't have a lot of support, but it has a lot of marketing, which is essentially what the Gracie family had, which is that's why, that's why it's so interesting to me because the the aspects of the English speaking world sections you know pieces of it not the whole of it but pieces of the English speaking world they they don't like uh, they they don't subside to um, IBJJF's leadership very much like the Gracie family didn't fall in within the Kotokan ranks and they are trying to do to IBJJF what the Gracie family did to the Japanese <laughs> basically you see little piece of history repeating itself they're trying to carve a new sport out of IBJJF well this- yeah because every new rule set it essentially introduces a new sport I mean that's what it boils down to I mean this isn't a very small subset but if this continues on and there is more and more organizations this will just go on right absolutely and, and it's exactly what happened before and I think it's they're trying to make it happen again and I, I hope it doesn't I, I'll tell you why um that's why I'm so happy I did Jeff legalized heel hooks. They did that recently. Yeah. I think they did a small role there. Like I've been in their ear the last five years about that one. Um, but it was unanimous amongst jiu-jitsu coaches, which so, shows cohesion. So they, they called all jiu-jitsu coaches of the major teams and they asked, what do you guys think about heel hooks? And it was unanimous. Minus one vote. I'm not going to mention who. You mentioned him earlier today. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I love the guy. But, he, uh, but it was unanimous other than that. And um, – it was, it shows cohesion. So wait a second, there's some hope here. We're agreeing, we're not disagreeing. And what the, the heel hook was, it was that Achilles heel. That was the, the that was the Nawaza of judo, the little space that was left out for something new and no longer exists. That, 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 that window just got shut. So now what? Now what's gonna happen? Now every white belt in our world, they're gonna be learning heel hooks. Perfect, beautiful. We augment the sport, we make it better. And there's a good chance that jiu-jitsu will survive. I think so. But I think that it requires unity. It requires us understanding our history, understanding our present, understanding our identity. And it requires cohesion. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think we need to stand by IBJJF. And I mean that not because I don't make money from them. I'm not a partner, I promise you. I'm very critical of them in a lot of ways. But I think that they gave us, they gave us credibility. And we need a Kotokan. No Kotokan, there's no judo. No IBJJF. There's no longevity to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as an art. We need them. The sport needs them. We need to stand behind them and, 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 and file and rank. And, and I think that's what's best for the sport. Yeah, and having one overseeing body of all the rules and regulations and everything, and it, I think that's what makes it legit. And that's why judo has been so successful um, you know, over the time. And I really hope that you're right. I'm, I really hope that you know, Jiu-Jitsu doesn't disappear. That puts me out of work. So uh, yeah, no, let's, let's, let's keep it up. It makes two of us right there. Robert, listen, the, I, we could talk about this literally for like all day long. I, I have like a million questions, but at some point we got to wrap this up. So um, I, first of all, I really appreciate, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day and sharing some of those thoughts. 
Um, before we finish this, we, we didn't tell you this, but we have five quick questions for you. And some of them are funny, some of them are not, but it kind of generates the uh, just end of the, end of the conversation in a very interesting way. Um, we would like to answer the questions. The first thing that comes to your mind, quick, short, just share some thoughts with us. How was that? Absolutely. All, All right, right, let's get to it. Yeah. Uh, what was it like the first time you stepped on the mat? Very anxious, very excited. Um, got tapped by a girl twice. Uh, I had a what happens? Too. No, no, oh, yeah. I went there because I knew her from school. I can't remember her name. Gianni, I think it was name. And I crush on her from school. And, um, and she was really, she was beautiful, right? I'm like, oh, man, I got excited. I'm going to roll with her. She beat my ass. <laughs> and she, she, was like, she was like yellow belt, I think. I was a white belt. We were about, you know, she was a yellow belt. And she had me in that Kasaga tummy, and she's like pushing her fist into my neck. And I'm panicking because I've never been choked before. I'm like, I'm supposed to tap. I don't know. I'm tapping. <laughs> And uh, fuck, man, it was. It, I remember like, it's so funny to remember that because she was coming at me like she hated me or something. I don't know. Like, I don't know if she mad at me or something. I think that's just how you train, right? You're supposed to be aggressive. And she caught me twice the same way. And I walked off the mats with like two thoughts. The first one is, you know, I blew my chances with her. Like, there's no way on earth that after getting <laughs> with her, she's gonna be attracted to me. Like I don't know. I don't, probably ruin my chances. But the second thought process was. Uh, the second thought was just like, this stuff works. Wait a second. I just got my ass kicked by a girl. Like, this stuff is legit. This is, this is no BS over here. Like, a choke is a legit way of winning a fight. You know, so that was, I think that was like the, that was the important lesson. Nice. All right. Second question is, what has been your most rewarding achievement? Oh, children, by far. By far. This I'm, is so interesting because as many people as we ask, that answer comes up very, mm -hmm. very frequently. Well, I think... Yeah, I think anybody who, you know, we, when we talk to the people, obviously, who don't have them, they don't have that to say. But the older generation, um, it's all, it doesn't matter what medal you've won. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've done career-wise. It's always, it always comes back to the kids. Yeah. It's something happens in your mind. And Mother Nature knows best. Like something happens in your mind where your selfishness and your cluelessness, like everything changes when you become a parent because you're responsible for another human being's well-being and survival. So, and education. <clears throat> and um, it's a very, very rich experience. Like, I, I don't disrespect, I mean, don't mean disrespect to people who don't want to have children. I, everyone to each their own, right? Everyone's got their own journey. I don't understand it, though. Like, I, I can't imagine life without music. I can't imagine life without jujitsu. I can't imagine life without books. I can't imagine life without children. Like, it's mm -hmm. the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me. It's funny because, like, you're, you're right about the accomplishments. Like, they lose their merit. Like, if you, like, obviously, 180cc was probably the, you know, and I you know, black with the pinnacle of my jitsu career. But if you took those two away from me, right, and you said, Rob, that's miraculously going to disappear, I don't think I'd give a shit at this point in my life. <laughs> it's like, you know, I have to probably change my profile, my Instagram, and that's about it. <laughs> my Wikipedia will probably be edited by someone, but that's it. Like, nothing else changes in my life. You know, like you... you but I bet you can't say that about your kids. No, no absolutely exactly. not. Exactly. You can't say that about your kids. It's very different. No, yeah, it changes everything. Uh, have you ever wanted to quit? Oh, yeah. There was one time... Uh, the brown belt. I mean, I don't think how I don't know how serious I was about it, but uh, it was quite emotional for me because, like, I'm not going to mention names, but you guys will know who they are if you do the math in my jujitsu history. You might figure out what I'm talking about, but you know, it was you can have an amazing coach who you don't get along with. I don't know if you've ever had that. Like, this guy's a phenomenal coach. <laughs> Holy cow! This guy is going to make me a champion. It is worth the drive here, but you have so different from them in, in terms of personality, like you couldn't be further away. And then the guy acknowledges that. And he's such an egomaniac that he just, he wants to try to change you. Like you got to be like me. You got to listen to the music I listen to. You got to go to the same church I go to. You got to do, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm sorry. Like I'm here for jujitsu. I'm not your little minion. I'm not your, you know, I don't look up to you off the mats. I never said it, but I made it very clear. I admire you as a coach. And I made, not through my actions, I made that very clear. And that upset him. So he would pick on me a lot. I was a brown belt. And my response to being picked on all the time by him was, I'm going to beat all your students. So all the students who would his ass and like, really, these are my minions. I just whoop them on the mats. That's my fucking response. And that would make him angry. And then uh, <clears throat> this is, you know, and at some point, you know, like 
he, uh, um, he was so angry, he called me out. And this is at the end of class when everyone wasn't training anymore, everyone's just watching. And that sort of had like an Arab challenge because he wanted to teach me a lesson. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget, like, <laughs> I got his back and I locked a body triangle on it. <laughs> and then he couldn't get out. The whole class is just like, fuck. <laughs> Everyone's just like holding the door. What back. do we do now? That's an awkward moment. <laughs> I didn't want to finish him. I could have, but I did. And so I just, I didn't know what to do. So I just stayed on his back and he couldn't get out. This went on for like 10 minutes and he couldn't get out. And I'm just holding on. And then he finally called it stops. And then everybody was staring and then he started yelling at everyone and making everyone climb the rope after class. <laughs> <laughs> he took it out on everybody else. <laughs> really climbing rope. And, uh, but uh, it was funny because all my friends later were like, bro, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> do you, so just in this story, do you think that that <clears throat> taught that, that man any humility or was it just another, you know, he's just pissed off now and he's going to take it out on class like he did at the end. No, he, he never changed. He never, never changed. changes. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, martial arts, I, I think there's one mistake in my book. I make a, I, there's a huge blind spot there. And it was actually Joe Silva that made me aware of it. I was on the phone with him because I sent him a copy of the book and he gave me a call and we spent some time on the phone talking about it. He pointed out a blind spot. He goes, martial arts does not necessarily make you a better person any more than religion does. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's such a great Mm-hmm. Martial arts can make you worse. And in my experience, some of the best grapplers in the world are also some of the ones that are most charismatic, but have zero character. Mm-hmm. Like, and they're phenomenal martial artists. So the character has nothing to do with your religion, has nothing to do with your martial art, or how good you are at martial arts. Character has to do with how you act under pressure and what decisions you make when no one's watching. Right. And I, I, and I think I give the impression in my book that martial arts does make you a better person, the dough. Right. And, I'm, I think that is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's um, to some extent, that's true. I think that the potential for the the lessons are there, but you don't necessarily learn them. You know, I've seen very many, many successful rappers who are horrible, horrible people. Yeah. And, I've heard some things, uh, re, you know, as I get older, I start thinking this way that it more, it more so it puts a spotlight on the type of person you already are. Uh, and it, and it can inflate that part of your personality and that, that part of, of who you are, uh, rather than change it. You know, yeah. um, and I think that comes with age too, that you start figuring those things out. So, no, I think you're right. It inflates what's already there. I think there's an old quote in politics, but I think it applies to jujitsu. Power doesn't change people, it exposes them. Yep. Nice. I like it. 100%. All right. Let's move on. Uh, describe your feelings when you received your black belt. I think I cried. Maybe a little, not like, you know, but like, you know, not little- ugly cry. No, it wasn't an ugly crack. Maybe like red, red eye. <laughs> it is an emotional moment. I mean, I think it is. For those who have experienced it, they know it's an emotional moment. I was, um, I had just won Brazilian Nationals like the weekend before or the week before. And we were like, you know, four points behind Brazilian top team. 2004, Brazilian Nationals. And I won the Open Brown Belt. And then they, um, and we, we turned it around. So we won Brazilian Nationals that year because of, like, it was the last fight of the day, too. So there was, like, huge expectation on that fight. But me winning the gold medal gave us the lead. So we beat Brazilian top team, which is, like, probably the biggest nice. team in Brazil at the time. Uh-huh. And, um, and then the next, I don't know if it was the next day or the next weekend or the next class. I can't remember. It was, like, right after I got my, uh, uh, my black belt from Leo Vieira. And it was, it was a very emotional moment because... Like I said, like I, I had been, uh, I had a rough ride as a brown belt. Like I almost quit. I, didn't, I think I would have quit, but like there was a minute that I didn't want to train anymore because I didn't want to see my coach. I don't want to see those people. I didn't want to see people that are in that gym, even though I love the train, I didn't want to be around them. I thought it was a very negative environment and it proved to be a very negative environment over time. It turns out that I was right about that. And, um, but like, you know, like training with, with Leo was a uh, very, uh, a very rich experience in, in terms of uh, finding a home, even though we were only like, it was only me and Lucas Lecce. People don't like talk about Braza, like it was this grand team back in the day. It was like, it was me and Lucas Lecce reality. And that's how it started. It was really that. The, <laughs> and then from then it grew, it grew, like everyone came afterwards. But the, like it was, you know, Leo running class and me and um, uh, Lucas Lecce rolling a lot, training, you know, nonstop. But that was, that was, uh, those, those are good days. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. And then uh, this is Thomas's favorite question is, uh, do you wash your belt? (laughs) Uh, I never have, but I'm not against it. I never have. uh, I never got used to it. Like I I bought that whole, like you're, you're washing the soul out of your, you know, (laughs) and I, and I just, okay, I don't wash my belt. So I never have, but I'm not against, I think you should every now and then because it is pretty gross. 
But there's someone said something the other day. I think it was Jean Jacques Machado because he's going to be the narrator for the documentary. By the way, oh, I wonderful. In California. I had a, I had a chat with him, and uh, what was fun about that interview was that um, we had a lot of you know, like fun conversation afterwards over there. And I think I asked him that question. He said something about I like to think that there's a piece of every person I've ever rolled with on my belt, like even if it's their sweat, you know, or bacteria. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Even if that's it good, is, yeah. That, that's <laughs> spinning the very dirty <laughs> view on that. Very dirty person. Well, you could look at it as an actual piece or uh, a part of their soul, maybe a little bit more of their personality than. Yeah, but I, I mean, he's, I, I, look, and I can't remember if it was, it might have not been Jean Jacques. I might have missed Like someone said that the other day. I'm thinking it's Jean Jacques. I can't remember. But anyway, but. You know, I think they, you know, the original sense is, is the soul, but like it really is only bacteria on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, bacteria, thousands of people on it. So you should watch it and watch it. Every day. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Robert, thank you. thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for sticking out with us. Thank you for sharing the stories. Listen, few things before we wrap up where they can, where everybody can get the book. Uh, talk a little bit quickly about the movie. When is that available? Where, how, where's your website? Where can people find you? Um, you know, just share some of the information about you. So film will be out. Um, we don't have a date yet. We, we had a, a deadline for the summer of this year. We obviously didn't meet that deadline for a variety of reasons. I think coronavirus has held everything back. And we run into some plot developments. It's very difficult to tell the story in 90 minutes. It's, it's too dense for a book. Imagine for a 90 minute so what cutting out is a very difficult question to answer. And as soon as you cut one thing out, you have to, re have to change the whole film. You can't just like remove one little thing and leave it. You have to, what about this, this, and that? And then next thing you know, you have to change five of them, right? So it's a very difficult project. Uh, my team is late. They are behind schedule. Um, they're very talented, but they're very late as well. So, you know, there's that as well. But we're, it's the good news is we're not under budget. We still have the money to finish the film. That's that's the key ingredient, right? We're out of money, mm -hmm. then you're screwed. But like we still yeah. have money. That's, that's the good news. And uh, it's going to be done. I, I just don't, I really can't give you guys a date. But if you want to learn more about the project, if you're interested in reading the book, which I think is, there's more depth to the book than the film, which is normally the case. The book is always going to be a, a richer experience than, than a film. There's no way around that. But you can get a copy at closedguardfilm.com closedguardfilm.com we have some posters there soon we're coming out with a portuguese translation of the book a polish translation of the book a spanish translation of the book possibly german and french you know i audiobook maybe in a couple years i'm not going to have an audiobook so soon probably not going to do an ebook um so yeah they're all they're all available i mean closedguardfilm.com it's all there and uh yeah follow us on instagram closedguardfilm on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, I recommend it. Um, I love the book. It's awesome. A lot of good stories. I think it really brings. And I, honestly, it kind of got me excited about the, the film. So I'm waiting for it. I can't wait. So um, good job on the project. Thank you for sharing all the information with us. Um, I'll be waiting for the film to come, whenever that is. Gary? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for everything. Uh, we didn't get enough of your story, so hopefully we can follow up with you at some point and really talk about you and, and your accomplishments. But uh, thank you for the, uh, the wonderful uh, history lesson, and uh, I hope it opens up a lot of eyes. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, anytime you, know, you guys want to do this again, uh, maybe after you guys watch the film, or uh, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you guys giving me the time and the space. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Peace. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care.